introduced Dror Bikel. He founded and leads a New York matrimonial law firm focused on high conflict, high net worth divorces. Labeled in the media as New York's scariest divorce lawyer. Is that an oxymoron? He shepherds the well heeled set through their marital splits. Sports figures, billionaires, entertainment notables, Wall Street financiers, politicians, or their spouses are his clientele. In 30 years as New York City's go to divorce and prenup lawyer, he has distilled some valuable lessons for anyone going through or considering divorce. I didn't know it was a how to. <laughs> His upcoming book, The 1% Divorce Clash of the Titans, is set for publication in September. Good morning. So, uh, I got to use this one. Okay. People ask me all the time, how is it that people who meet, fall in love, get married, have children, perhaps have some financial success, how is it that those people, why is it that those people engage in bitter, protracted, expensive, acrimonious divorce proceeding. How did they get from being in love to absolutely hating each other? How does that happen? Well, some people say, is it, is it the lying? Is, it, is that what it is? Well, lying, lying isn't good. I mean, it's not, not a good thing for a marriage. Is it the cheating? Well, that's not good either. Um, is it the stealing? Is that what causes this? You're fine, you're fine. Um, stealing definitely contributes. But I would say the one quality, the one feeling that results in an acrimonious protracted divorce is anger. And how is it in a long-term marriage do people get so angry at each other? And it's a difficult question to answer. And I think what happens, based on my observations, is that people over time lose the ability to communicate effectively. <clears throat> what happens is that they hurt each other intentionally or unintentionally. Somebody reacts, hurts their spouse. There's another counter reaction. And then people kind of get calcified and cornered in their positions. And they're ready to just go at it, to the point where they just can't communicate with each other, and they often need psychologists or lawyers to communicate between them. And then they end up in court. And divorce court is kind of unique, because there's, while there is a lot of case law and statute, on the other hand, there really isn't, in the sense that the judges sit as a court in equity, meaning they can use their judgment based on wide parameters. And they apply such kind of vague principles as best interests of the child or financial contribution. So what do those terms mean? Well, good question. It may depend on the judge and it may depend on the time of day. These are very vague concepts. So when you have angry people, and you have vagueness in the law, that results in long, protracted, acrimonious litigation. Now, 
Several years ago, I was involved in a case, um, I'm going to show you a little video clip, that captured what I just said, but in an extreme way. It has everything, and it had everything. And I will tell you the story from my perspective as the attorney for the wife, Sophie Manu, of Tony Tung, the gentleman that is about to be interviewed on the screen. Day after day, Tony Tung watched the prosecution portray him as a cold-blooded killer. It wasn't a pretty picture, and according to Tony, it wasn't a true one either. There's a lot of bad things adding up here. Where he was killed, you wiping your computer hours after the murder, you going to visit him. Yeah, but it's like, I didn't kill him. Did you have someone drive you over no. to Teaneck? No. For Sandra Milan, the prosecution's theory that Tony murdered his wife's lover out of jealousy made no sense. Sometimes in crimes of passion, it's, you don't really think it through. You're angry. Well, crime of passion, when you're angry, that happens right then, doesn't it? Does it really happen over a year later when things are working out? Turns out that was the same argument Tony Tung's attorney, Robert Kalish, made to the jury. Why, he asked, would Tony kill Rob a year after Rob had shown him the bed where he had sex with his wife? If he didn't kill him right there and then, he wasn't going to kill him at all. Because that was the time to do it, with his bare hands. According to Kalish, investigators never seriously considered the possibility that someone else may have wanted Rob Cantor dead. Tony was the only suspect. Another potential suspect, Kalish said, was the stranger who had been spotted near the Cantor home shortly before the fire. Charles Johnston was the neighbor who reported the man to police. I saw an older gentleman, approximately 65 or 70, white male with a, with a red cap on white hair. Was it someone from the neighborhood? No. Bergen County detectives never followed up on that. Okay. What happened? I represented Tony's wife, Sophie Manu. Sophie came to me several years ago. She's a lovely, engaging, very smart and very beautiful accountant from France. And she came to me and she said, I want to get a divorce. I'm in a new relationship with a man named Rob Cantor. My husband's name is Tony Tung. Tony's a good father. Uh, we have three girls, ages eight, six, and four. And Tony can see the girls whenever he wants. I don't want any money from him. The girls will be with me. He's a fine father. I just want to get a divorce. So we thought, okay, that's a pretty easy case. There's nothing unique about it. We asked the usual questions of, Sophie, are you safe at home? Are there any issues that you need to tell us about? Um, and she said, no, I just want to get out of this marriage. So we sent Tony a letter, a standard lawyer letter, that says that we represent your wife Sophie. Sophie would like to resolve your divorce amicably without judicial intervention. Please call me or have your attorney call me. A couple months went by and we didn't hear anything from Tony. So Sophie came to our office and said, look, he's having a hard time with this divorce. Why don't you serve him with divorce papers? We don't have to go to court. Just serve him with the papers. I'll pay for his lawyer. We'll get him set up with an attorney, and we'll just move on. So okay. So we hired a process server, and we filed what's called the summons, which is a form that you file to start a divorce proceeding. Filed it with the court. And we served Tony on a Friday. Two days later, Tony travels from Manhattan, the east side of Manhattan, to New Jersey, Bergen County, Teaneck, New Jersey, which is in northern New Jersey. He goes to the home of Sophie's boyfriend, Rob Cantor, 
a guy in his 50s who was separated from his wife at the time. They weren't living together, although they had a good relationship, Rob and his wife. Rob had two children, adults. Tony took Rob at the point of a gun to the basement of his home where Rob had first had relations with Sophie. He shot Rob in the back of the head and burnt Rob's body and burnt the home. That night, Sophie calls us in a panic and tells us that Rob had been murdered. The next day, and, and Sophie also tells us that she believed that Tony committed the murder. And of course, we had never, never heard anything bad about Tony. All we had heard was that Tony was a good father and a good guy. That Monday, we go to court, and again, we're divorce lawyers, we're not prosecutors. This is all done civilly, meaning civil court, not criminal court. We go to court and we request what's called an order of protection. An order of protection is a civil order, it's not a criminal order, it's a civil order requiring Tony to stay away from Sophie and her three children. And if he violates the order, he is subject to criminal penalties. But the order itself is a civil order. Kind of a unique proceeding in a family law case. And that morning, we appeared before a judge named Marva Burnett, a very experienced judge in New York family court. And we said, we think that uh, Tony Tung killed Rob Cantor. And referee Burnett said, has there been an arrest? And we said, no. And she looked at me and she said, how do you know that Mr. Tung did it? And I said, I don't. But we need the order. And she gave it to us. Tony was served. Judge Burnett ordered us to come back to court one week later. And when you first go to family court, you go alone, meaning it was just me and Sophie. Tony wasn't there. You go what's called ex parte, on your own. So Tony did not have an opportunity to defend himself. And as these things go, Judge Burnett ordered us to come back to court one week later with Tony, so we had to serve him with the order, and then he would come to court to defend himself. We served Tony with the order of protection immediately, and immediately we contacted the Bergen County detective, the detectives police department to find out what was going on, because if we didn't have any evidence that Tony committed this, then there would be no order of protection and we wouldn't know what would happen. So we came to court that one week later with the investigative detectives and we had a short hearing and they told Judge Burnett that Tony is a person of interest in the murder of Rob Cantor. He is the only person of interest. And they looked at Tony Tony was with his lawyers, Tony looked at me, he looked at them, and he said, I didn't do this. Judge Burnett granted an extension of the order of protection. It was a temporary order, and every month or two, for a year, we were back in court extending the order uh, with the detectives. During that year, Sophie went to work with bodyguards, her children uh, were not allowed to have playdates or sleepovers after school. They were told to immediately come home. She was scared for her life, for the life of her children. But there was no arrest. And time went on. Um, <clears throat> we learned for the first time that some troubling things had occurred during the marriage. That. Tony was a hoarder, that he was addicted to pornography, 
that he did not contribute one penny economically to the marriage, that he had put spyware on Sophie's computer and knew about her affair with Rob. Now, of course, uh, Rob was a very well-liked person in his community. He had a ton of friends. Um, he met Sophie, they fell in love, they went to uh, cultural activities and lectures and museums together uh, before he was killed. We also learned that Sophie and Tony had gone to a couples therapist named Anne McDonald, who was in her 70s, and that Tony had said some troubling things to Anne, such as, revenge is best served cold. And Sophie's relationship with Ron didn't start right, and, it's, and therefore, it's not going to end right. But of course, that's not evidence of murder. That's just weird. But that doesn't mean he committed murder. We met with Rob's friends, who were convinced that Tony had committed the murder, but beyond that, had really no evidence. And a year went by. And after a year, without an arrest, Tony was feeling emboldened. And he wanted to have contact with the children. He wanted to see his children, his three girls. So he made an application to lift the order of protection as it pertained to his children. And Judge Burnett said, look, it's been a year. Either there's an arrest or there's not an arrest. I can't keep this order going forever. We're going to have a trial on the order of protection. So the order of protection was a temporary measure. It lasted a year, the temporary order. But in order to have a permanent order of protection, and by permanent I mean three years, I don't mean forever, three years renewable, we need to have a trial, an evidentiary hearing. So Sophie and I prepared for a trial. And I was going to call Ann McDonald in, Ann McDonald, and I asked, and Sophie's, uh, I'm sorry, Rob's friends, if they would come in, in and testify, because they had some favorable evidence, and they said, no, actually, we will not, because we're scared of Tony. He's a scary guy, and we have children, and we're not going to do it. We don't know Sophie, and we're not going to do it. And of course I could subpoena them and require them, but that's not great if they're not willing, right? Because I don't know what they're going to say if they're, not on my, if they're not voluntarily coming to court. But Ann McDonald, who's a grandmother, said, sure, no problem, of course I'll testify. So she was my one witness. So I asked Ann, are you scared of time? She said, come on. I'm in my 70s. I'm not scared of anybody. Of course I'm going to come testify. So the trial was scheduled for a Monday. And five days earlier, on that Wednesday, I get a call from the prosecuting attorneys um, in Bergen County, New Jersey, across the river. And remember that there was no evidence that Tony was in New Jersey, just like this video clip said. There's no evidence, and after September 11th, there are videos and all the bridges and tunnels in going in and out of New York to New Jersey, the Holland Bridge, the George Washington Bridge, the Lincoln, I'm sorry, the Holland Tunnel, the Lincoln Tunnel. There's videos all over the place. And there was no video of Tony coming into New Jersey from Manhattan at the time of the murder. So we, Sophie and I go to the prosecutors, and Wayne Mello, the lead prosecutor who was mentioned on this clip, asked me if I thought I would succeed in this trial continuing the order of protection. And I said to him, yes and no. Yes for Sophie, no for the children. Unless you have evidence to give me. And he said, well, we're not going to do that, um, but thank you very much for the information. Good luck. 
that Friday, so two days after I went to the prosecutor's office and two days before the trial, Sophie's in my office and we're preparing for trial, and we get a call from the detectives, Cecilia Love, who said, I need to see you right now. I said, okay. She showed up in my office and she said, we just arrested Tony for murder abroad. He sat in jail, waiting trial for a year, and he was convicted of first degree murder. So, that was the case. And of course, Sophie, Sophie then moved to Europe with his, her children, um, and Tony's in jail. So, that's a case, right, where everything went wrong. You have addiction. Tony was addicted to pornography, and that's an, that's an addiction. You have dishonesty. Sophie was having an illicit affair until it wasn't illicit. And you have bullying and intimidation by Tony. But mostly, what you have is uncontrolled, fierce, murderous, Angry. And that's the feeling that drives most of these high conflict, contested, protracted, expensive, and by mean expenses, expensive, I'm talking seven figure expensive, and it's not, not saying my fees, and that's standard operating procedure in New York seven-figure divorce proceedings that last years. And I'm not talking two or three years, I'm talking five or six years. Yes? It, it sounds like he was completely financially dependent on his wife. Wasn't that an issue? It was an issue. Um, and uh, those are the hardest cases to resolve, actually. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not just talking about Tony and Sophie, actually, but when it's the wife who is the primary earner and the primary caretaker, and there's a lot of people whose marriages dissolve because the husband is not contributing. The wife does, takes care of everything related to the children, the social activities, the medical appointments, the educational issues. The wife handles it all, plus she earns all the money. Those are the most difficult cases, actually, because to ask the wife, mom, to pay the husband is swallowing, a, ask her to swallow a very bitter pill. It's usually the reason why they want to get divorced in the first place, right? The husbands don't want to get divorced. They're good with this arrangement. It works for them. It's the wife who usually drives those divorces, understandably. But the law would require them to actually pay the husband, usually spousal support, and uh, the husband may get a, a large percentage of the marital estate assets acquired during the marriage. So, yes, <laughs> to answer your question, Tony was dependent on Sophie. And that was an issue. Yes? With the criminal charges pending or uh, possibly pending, how could Tony even defend himself in a, uh, in a quote unquote civil proceeding? For so, Great question. Um, at that time, in New York, you actually needed to have a reason to get divorced. For, <laughs> no, no longer. Now you can get divorced on irretrievable breakdown of the marriage. There's no real burden of proof for that. But at that time, in 2012, New York was one of the few states, and I'm talking about one or two or three states, that, uh, requ that required parties to have grounds. And grounds consisted of 
adultery, which is very hard to prove, cruelty, abandonment um, were the main ones. Constructive abandonment, which means you didn't have relations with your spouse for a year, which is what everybody went on, even though, you know, whatever, but <laughs> judges kind of turned a blind, blind eye to that. You know, people just testified about constructive abandonment. But um, Tony, when it came to divorce time, so now we're no longer in, now we have an order of protection. We have a three-year order of protection. He's arrested. He doesn't contest the order of protection. That's done. So if he gets a three-year order of protection, that's renewable after three years. Now we have to get a divorce. Well, Tony doesn't agree to get divorced. And he's not convicted of anything. He's sitting in jail, but he hasn't been convicted of anything. So how do I get somebody divorced? I mean, it seems absurd that she can't get divorced, right? It's, it's not like uh, Saudi Arabia. She should be able to get divorced. So we get assigned to another judge. Judge Matt Cooper. Matt Cooper is a tough judge. And Matt Cooper said, he doesn't want to get divorced, this is what's going to happen. He's going to testify from jail, Sophie will testify about grounds, and she's going to get divorced. So we had a hearing, he actually, Tony made us do this by not agreeing, where Tony testified from jail, and objected to the divorce, and Sophie testified about incidences of cruelty, and she got divorced. And he still has to pay child support, actually. The statutory minimum, regardless of incarceration, is $50 a month. And he's obligated to pay it. He is in default. <laughs> but, you know, we're not going to do anything about that. Yes? Maybe. The, the question is, could Tony have gotten to New Jersey on public transportation? Maybe, but you know, there's videos on all public transportation as well, in all the stations. I mean, in New York City, as an aside, the, the police don't rarely go to somebody to make an arrest. There are so many cameras around. If somebody commits a crime, you know, uh, thievery in Midtown on 48th Street, or I'm sorry, 46th Street, the Diamond District, somebody goes in with a gun and steals some diamonds. There's so many cameras that piece, the, the police will just call the guy and say, come surrender, don't make us send a squad car out. We got you on tape. <laughs> so, so maybe, I, I don't know, I, I think what, what, what I heard, what I heard was that what Tony did was he, he was in the backseat of a car but went really low when they went through the tunnel or the bridge. Probably the bridge, George Washington Bridge. He just, he just stayed very low and the cameras didn't see him. That's the theory. So, yes? Um, so, um, in orders of protection, so interrogatories and depositions, so the, those are techniques to exchange information. Um, so in orders of protection, you're actually not allowed to do that in New York. Oh, the divorce proceeding, yeah, sure, but for what, to what end, I mean, there was no, he was in jail for murder then. What's, I, I mean, he had no money, there was no reason for us to do it, and I mean, he, you know, he didn't have the capacity to do it. He could have, you're right, he could have. He could have sent us requests for information and we would have had to comply. But, didn't happen. The main issue was just getting her divorce and overcoming the statutory requirement of grounds. So, uh, other, sometimes, uh, uh, people ask me on occasion, what's, what's unique about New York? Uh, is there anything special about a New York divorce? 
um, very wealthy people, known people, famous people. Well, I will say this. What is unique about New York is that we get everybody. Represent the Eastern European oligarch, or a well-known gallerist, or an academic, or a sports figure, or a health coach, a teacher, a lawyer. Lawyers are terrible clients. Um, um, just you get everybody. And I think that is kind of unique in New York. Um, we get international divorce issues, I think more than other jurisdictions, and we have a bunch now that we're dealing with. Um, also, you get different categories of assets that you may not get in other places, such as alternative investments, like collectibles, stamps, cars, coins. I mean, that happens everywhere, but I think you get a lot of that in New York, proprietary interests on intellectual property, um, those kinds of things that are unique to New York. But the truth is, the famous people, the wealthy people, they have the exact same issues as everybody else. It's nothing unique to their issues other than, unfortunately for them, sometimes it's, their issues are played out in public. Um, and usually they ask the lawyers to keep discretion, they like to keep the courtroom closed from reporters and things like that to maintain their uh, privacy. But generally, the top 1% are just like everybody else. There's, there's nothing special in terms of their issues. And in fact, just to give you an example, and I, I just say this from the outside, um, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, their dynamic, and again, I, I'm not involved in this case, and it's only from the outside what I read, but I'll make a few assumptions about that case. Number one, Brad Pitt has a substance abuse problem. And this was a, a, a relationship and a marriage that was very productive. They have children, and they're both wildly successful. But he has substance abuse problems. How do I know that? because his parenting time is limited, right? He doesn't have, initially, he needed to have third parties present during his parenting time. What does that tell me? That tells me that the judge felt that the children may have been unsafe alone in his presence. We also know that for the past year since the separation, he has stayed off the radar. He is working on himself. He is not out in public. So that tells me that he's getting treatment and he's trying to heal. And apparently now he's doing better and he's asking for more time with the children, which, is, which makes sense. And frankly, the courts love somebody who went into rehab. They're the best parties in the world. Why? because those are the people that are reflective. Those are the people that have had a hard time, have had issues, and have worked on themselves. People who are reflective and who, are work on, who have worked on themselves are better parents. So it's okay if you're not perfect, if you faced it and you worked on it. And that appears to be what he did. However, she is having difficulty letting go of the children, as reported in the press. She's objecting to his expanded request for expanded parenting time. That is also very typical because she had witnessed, presumably, years of him being high or drunk or whatever it was around the children. And so it's hard for her to forget those memories. And it's hard for her to trust the fact that he is now sober. So she's tight with the time. That's understandable too. And of course the judge threatened her and said, if you don't let go, you're gonna have problems with the children. And the power, the dynamic then in terms of custody went to her initially, but then swung to him. You know, and these things go back and forth for years, frankly. 
but hopefully they'll work it out and, and you know, it seems like things have settled down a little bit. Um, yes? Well, <laughs> I can say a lot about it, but um, here's the thing about prenups. Um, if, if they're well written and well thought out, they will be enforced, and it'll, it, they'll be enforced, and the divorce will be in accordance with the terms of the prenup. But I will say this, and this is one of the reasons I'm, 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 sh I'm very shy of prenups. <laughs> There's two types of people that want a prenuptial agreement. Type A, second marriage, somebody four years old or older, widower or divorced with, or, or a widow, widower, divorced with children, or, or divorced with children. Those people, they don't want to fight about money, they have a career, they have assets, they have children, they're only going to get into a new relationship if they have an ironclad prenup, and if the, if the relationship doesn't work out, they don't have to fight about money. And I understand that. And that makes some sense. However, sometimes you get younger people in their 20s who's, who have really, I mean, who in their 20s have really done much, right? Not everybody. <laughs> but on average, most people in their 20s after college, you know, are just getting started. Their family, they come from wealth, and the families want them to do a prenup. And that's a problem, because the person who doesn't come from the wealthy family is often asked to waive very important rights. For example, if the husband comes from a wealthy family, and the family says and wants a prenup that says that they're going to buy him an apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and let's say a three-bedroom costs three million dollars. It costs more, but let's just use three million dollars. If they separate, and it's an all-cash purchase, if they separate, that apartment goes to him, and she has to vacate the apartment within 90 days. Which on its face may sound not the most horrible thing. While they're married, they get to live in this great apartment in a great neighborhood. But what's the reality? Fast forward 10 years. They have three children in private schools. She's at home with the kid. One of the kids has special needs. So she dropped her career as a physician to take care of the children, and particularly this one child. And he, he works, but let's just give him credit. He's a good dad. He's not addicted to anything. He's not abusive. He just wants out of the marriage. She now has to vacate after three years. Where's she going to go? I mean, she can't afford to live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Where's she going to go to, God forbid, the Bronx, where I live? <laughs> I mean, you know, and the children are going to, they're, they're, they're in private school in Manhattan. They're not, they're not going anywhere to the Bronx. So, well, it depends what the prenup says. After so many years of marriage, you get X amount of time. It depends what the prenup says. Right, <laughs> Right? I mean, you have to negotiate all those points. And it depends what the prenup says. And to be honest with you, I, I, I had a case where the, the, um, the wife was way, the, 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 the husband to be, came from a lot of money. Well, he didn't even know he came he had, his parents had so much, so much money. They never told him, it was like $50 million. He had no idea, actually. And their lawyer had the most complicated prenup. It ended up, she ended up, my client, this, the, the woman, signed it, but it, it was very distasteful. And I wasn't happy about it. A couple weeks later, the same kind of fact pattern but I, I'll, and again, I had the wife-to-be. And I told her, like, what are you doing? Do you really need to sign this prenup? And I explained to her all the things she was waving. And her response was, screw him. I'm not getting married. <laughs> Forget that. And I, I stood up, I gave her a hug. I'm like, thank you. I just did this a couple weeks ago, and I feel so oily about it. Like, I just, you know. 
So, you know, you got to be careful with these things, and particularly the young people. Second marriage, it's okay, you know, you kind of understand it when people are older and they, they come to it with children and a career. But the young people, it's, it's, you got to be careful with it. Somebody had a question. What were, I'm sorry, you're, oh, parental alienation. Okay, I'll tell you an alienation story. Um, so what is parental alienation? Parental alienation is when one party, and statistically, it's almost always the mother. One party with a young child orients the child against the father so severely by disparaging the father that the child becomes alienated and the characteristics include not wanting to see the father, calling the father by his first name, not calling him dad, and blaming the father for the divorce and for whatever else. It's terrible. It's terrible, it's hard to fix, and I, I mean, we've represented alienators. I mean, you know, it's hard. You know, you try to get the mental health treatment, you try to, you know, but there, it's, you know, I don't know. Um, but the courts, the irony is that if a child is alienated, the courts will not generally, Matt Cooper, the judge I spoke about before, is an exception, but most judges in Manhattan will not make the alienated child be with the father. They won't do that for, because it's too hard on the child, for fear that it puts too much stress on the child, and as the child gets older, for fear that the child will run away, which happens. So the courts, in some sense, reward the alienator. It's something you have to nip at the bud very early. But I'll, I'll tell you a little, I'll tell you a, a case though. <laughs> uh, um, I, I represented a guy, um, let's call him uh, Scott. And Scott's in finance and he's, he's, he's very successful. And his wife, let's call her Fran, uh, did not work and they had two kids. And their son, an eight year old, um, Let's call him Jim. Jimmy. Jimmy, when he was born, had, he came with uh, he was born with allergies, including peanut allergy, soy, and allergy to cow's milk, which is very common. And uh, um, Fran, the wife, took him to the best allergies in New York, an allergist named Scott Sisher. And these were usual allergies that are detected by uh, skin prick tests and um, blood tests. For those of you who have had it or have children, you know what I'm talking about. And Jimmy had these allergies. But over time, he began to get over these allergies, um, in particular the dairy allergy, and Scott, my client, began to give Jack pizza and ice cream, and he seemed to be fine with the allergies. Suddenly, they're getting divorced, and Fran says, well, he now has another allergy to cow's milk, a very severe allergy called f -pies, food protein endocolitis syndrome. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I never heard of that. Um, Scott tells me it's nonsense. I give Jimmy ice cream all the time. I know she's nuts. I don't know what she's talking about. But Scott Sischerer, the allergist, writes in his notes that according to the mother, this child has symptoms of f -pies. According to the history as reported by the mother, he has f -pies. So what do I know? And to frankly, my client is, he's a very successful guy, but on these things, you know, he's not going to win any awards. Um, so I don't really trust him, but it's a problem because Fran, the mother, is seeking to have my client's parenting time supervised by a babysitter because he doesn't accept this allergy and he is putting Jimmy's life at risk. 
Why? Because when you have ethpies and you ingest cow's milk, you vomit profusely, get dehydrated, need to be hospitalized, and can die from it. That is the claim of Fran's attorney in court. And my attorney is like, and my client, Scott, is talking about he doesn't have it. Maybe he has a little sensitivity. I'm like, Scott, what are you talking about? Like, you know, what do you... But that's what he's saying. So the only thing I can think of, and it's an important issue, because if we're wrong, she's going to get custody, no question. I mean, he's endangering the child. What is he thinking, even? But for some reason, I kind of trust him on this one. <laughs> So what do I do? I, I have to find an allergist to go through these records. But the problem is, there aren't a lot of allergists that actually testify in court. They're not like orthopedists or oncologists who are in court all the time on malpractice issues. Allergists, like, you never see an allergist in court, right? So like, I can't, there's nobody who's, you know, interested in looking at it. The only person I know is a guy I know from my synagogue who treats my son. He's the only guy I know, you know? So, uh, let's call him Brian. So I see Brian in synagogue and I said, Brian, will you do me a favor and look at these records of this kid? The mom said he has FIs, dad is on Mars, he doesn't, I don't, I, what do I know? You know, I don't know. And Brian said, who's the allergist? And I said, Scott Sischler. And Brian said, oh my God, Scott Sischler. First of all, I applied for a job with him and he didn't hire me, but he's the best, he's the best allergist in the country, perhaps in the world. Whatever he says is true. I'm not going against Scott Sischler. And I said, Brian, I'm not asking you to. Just review the records and let me know what's going on. So he did. He reviewed the records, and sometime later he came to me and he said, Dror, Jimmy does not have f -pies. He said, are you serious? He said, absolutely not. But there's only one way to find out, and that's through a food challenge. The kid needs to go to the allergist and actually do a food challenge. And of course, Fran, the mother, is not agreeing to, for Jack to have a food challenge. Um, because he had symptoms of f a couple months earlier, and it's not healthy for him so soon after having symptoms to have a food challenge. He'll have the symptoms again. It's terrible. It's dangerous. No way am I doing a food challenge. So we have a trial. It's the only way to resolve this. So we have a trial on Jimmy's advice, <laughs> and the judge is Deborah Kaplan, uh, who I, I know very well, appeared before her for years, and Brian is now on the witness stand, and we have Jimmy's medical records on, projected on the wall of the courtroom, and Jimmy's making graphs about proteins and antigen, I'm sorry, um, Brian, the doctor, the allergist, is making all these graphs and pictures, and, but he's an excellent witness. And he explains that a child who becomes desensitized to a, a food doesn't suddenly become resensitized later. And Jack had uh, gotten over his dairy allergy. So it's very unusual for him to now become resensitized to cow's milk. And by the way, excuse me, f pies only happens to infants, not to eight-year-olds. <laughs> I'm like, really? I have no idea. So, however, bit of a problem, which is that my adversary, let's call him Michael, subpoenas all of the communication between me and Brian, the doctor, which I had not anticipated. And of course, Brian brings all of my emails between us to court. And of course, I've known him for years. He's a friend. Oh my god. So 
the lawyer, Michael, sees these emails. He's like, oh my God, I struck gold. They're friends. They socialize together. Their kids had play dates together. And why is that important? That shows that Brian is biased. He's not an objective witness. He's biased. He's telling him, he's testifying to what I told him to testify. And Michael is cross-examining Brian and saying, oh my God, your daughter and Mr. Bikel's daughter went to Kidville together, didn't they? <laughs> and my client, Scott's looking at me, he's like, you did? <laughs> no, I did. Like, okay. Anyway. Judge Kaplan gets over all of that. Very embarrassing moment for me. One question, however, uh, Brian did not have to answer, which is when Michael, the lawyer, asked him, has Mr. Bikel referred you any patients? And of course, he treats my son. So I had a mini part of that, and uh, objected on the ground of confidentiality, and the judge sustained my objection, and it went nowhere. Phew. Um, but anyway, uh, Brian was such a good witness, Judge Kaplan ordered a field challenge, and Jimmy went to Dr. Sisher's office, and what they do is they administer like small amounts of dairy, wait for a reaction, then a little more, wait for a reaction, then a little more, and the whole process takes a couple hours, and he has to stay in the doctor's office all day. So of course Scott is texting me, I'm texting my wife, who's like on the seat, you know, on the edge of her seat, I'm, te I'm texting Brian, because he wants to know, and Scott is saying, well, first, first dose, Jimmy adjusted, no reaction. Second dose, no reaction. Third dose, no reaction. So he passed the food challenge. He did not have that pots. And uh, Fran lost custody, and um, Scott has custody, legal custody. Legal custody, which means the authority to make decisions over Jim, Jimmy's medical care. That is an example, I don't even, that's not necessarily alienation, it's just plain craziness. Um, <laughs> undiagnosed crazy. <laughs> we get a lot of that. <laughs> well, it's not much. It's um, there's a new word for Munchausen. Um, uh, it'll come to me. There's another word for it now. Uh, what was the basis of the mother's Well, her judgment. Her judgment. And she lied. She lied about. She lied about symptoms. There was a lot of. There's a lot of dishonesty in her presentation to the court. Yes, in the back. In New York, how often is mediation or arbitration used, or even collaborative used, to resolve divorces as opposed to trials? Um, that's a good question. I don't know because my clients don't do that. <laughs> and I don't mean that. It's because, no, it's not mandatory. It's because by the time you get to me, uh, that stuff. Uh, that's not what we do. Yep. So I have no idea, actually. It's mandatory in many places. No, yeah, it is mandatory in some states, not in New York. Yes. How much does this being cost? Oh, I, I mean, I, I don't know how. I mean, putting aside this case, I mean, people spend an insane amount of money. Insane. Seven figures on these divorces. But the conflict is so, sometimes it's daily. Sometimes you need a team of lawyers to keep up with this, you know. It's some of the financial issues, you know, there's some very, you know, we're dealing with very complicated assets, galleries. I mean, how do you value the art in a gallery with hundreds of pieces of art, some owned prior to the marriage, some purchased during the marriage, but the ones purchased during the marriage came from art that was owned prior to the marriage, is there separate property credits, hundreds of people, I mean, it's so complicated, you know, and then, but it's worth millions and millions of dollars, so to untangle that requires experts and teams of lawyers and make your head spin. Yes? And if they run 
run out of money in the middle of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course, we always represent people. You know, we don't care about you know how much money they have or don't have. No. Um, the so the the thing about New York, a lot of people who make a lot of money have no money. I mean, the the consumerism, the spending is insane. People think money is like monopoly money. There is no, so many people have no value. It doesn't have a value to them. People who earn a lot of money, people who earn an unimaginable amount of money, spend it all. I mean, I have a case, a, a, a person earns a, a, a $1.5 million. He owes a million dollars to the IRS. You know, girls, drinking, I don't know. Yes? Career question. There are a lot of attorneys. Don't do it. <laughs> there are a lot of attorneys in this world. How did you build this career? And what skills do you have that make you uniquely qualified to defend the rich? Well, I don't know if I am, uh, to be honest with you. Um, how did I get into this area? Um, I come from a litigation background, um, so I like litigating, trying cases. It's very interesting, it's fun, it's challenging, it's really hard. Um, you know, imagine being on trial and you have this one piece of evidence that you think is the most important piece of evidence, and you try to enter it into evidence, and your, uh, your opposing lawyer objects, and the judge sustains the objection. And you're like, oh my God, this is terrible. And the client's looking up and is like, do you know what you're doing here? I mean, that's, that's, that's happened. <laughs> but, you know, generally it's, it's fun. It's fun. Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, people come to me. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know why. To be honest. I'm shocked at the time. <laughs> No. No. I, it's so acrimonious. I don't see. If, they, if, you, if I ever see reconciliation, no. It's so acrimonious when you get to us. It's, I don't see how people can come back together. I mean, our job is to build our client up and to show faults in the other side. I mean, you know, and everybody, that's easy to show. Everybody has faults. So do I. And of course, I do too. It's easy to do, and I'm parenting and on money. I mean, it's terrible. It's hard to recover from that. I mean, these divorces are awful. I don't recommend it. Yes? Sometimes, yes, sometimes, you know, I. I mean, I had a client from 2007. They've been divorced for 10 years. Same crap from 11 years ago. Same. Yeah, but you know, parent coordinators, what, you know, in a high conflict situation, what can they do, really? We, we push people to parent coordinators. Parent coordinators are kind of therapist types that are experts in high conflict divorces. But, excuse me, they, they're not, what can they, you know? They can't do any better than the courts, honestly. We push people to parent coordinators just to get them away. But, <laughs> but they come back. Uh, <laughs> yes? Are these cases tried before a judge or a jury? And if it's a jury, do you have a part in selecting the jury? Bench trial. Bench trial. Yes. It used to be grounds you can try in front of a jury. I mean, I used to, in my prior career, I did jury trials, but jury trials are fun, much better than bench trials, but not in this, it's not appropriate for this area. Well, well, 
Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Um, although I did, uh, let me say this, that the terrible, uh, I mean, we get calls all the time where a party, a client would say, you know, my, 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 my child wants to commit suicide and, and we're going to, I'm taking him or her to Bellevue Hospital for psychiatric treatment. And my response usually is, well, no surprise there, the way you're behaving and your spouse. I mean, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, yes, of course. Like, what, what are you surprised? I mean, you're nuts and so is your spouse. <laughs> Uh, we don't have contact with the children, nor do I want it. They have their own lawyers. Lawyers get appointed to represent the children and their interests. But the children, of course, are in the middle. It's the worst. It's the next part parental alienation, disparagement, and it's terrible. The children, what happens is, in seriousness, the, the children lose the, the safety and trust that you have in parents, that your parents can take care of you. They lose that because the parents are fighting. That gets frayed. And it leads to mental health issues, relationship issues, educational challenges. I mean, the children are a mess. It's awful. Yes? I mean, yeah, sure, prenups, but you can't, you can't do an agreement about children in custody on a prenup because the children aren't born yet. So, and also for other issues, it's the, the court maintains authority over children. So prenups, no. I, I mean, again, it goes back to this issue of anger. And so if people, it's okay to be angry. It's a question of how it manifests itself. And if people can learn more self-control and to behave more generous, Look, divorces, these cases are so complicated. You have financial issues and custodial issues. The issues are so broad. And, you know, custodial issues involve parenting time. What school? What doctor? Their special needs? What services? You know, religion. Oh my God. I mean, people go nuts over this. Orthodox Jews will fight over which rabbi. Right? I mean, I had a case where the, the, it was a Korean American married a Jewish man and their daughter, the mother did not, the mother was Korean American. She did not convert to Judaism, but the daughter did. And they were getting divorced and the mom said, look, I did that when we were married, but I don't agree to it anymore. We're getting divorced. I'm Protestant. I want to raise her as a Protestant. As, according to my religion, why do we have to do his religion? And I said, well, what does that mean? I mean, is the child going to have a bat mitzvah on Saturday and confirmation on Sunday? I, I mean, we're like, but I, I kind of, I don't think she's necessarily wrong. Anyway, we went to trial. I had to subpoena the rabbi who did the conversion because as part of the conversion, she had to promise that she wouldn't introduce any other religion to the child. Otherwise, the rabbi would not have agreed to do the conversion. So she consented to this long term. He won on that issue. However, fast forward a couple of years, the appellate courts has said that that butts up against the First Amendment, actually, and religious rights. And she does have a right to raise this child. And that, if, it would be, if the law was as it is now, she would have the right to raise the child in whatever religion she sees fit. But that's because of recent case law. Back then, it wasn't allowed, so the husband won. Not a very likable guy, even though he's my client. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's smart. <laughs> okay. I don't know. 
I don't know if there's fraud. There's a, there's a very well-known fraud lawyer there in the corner. You can ask him. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> there was a fraud on the trust. I don't know if it's fraud. Yeah, I don't know. Yes? Well, what are the most common ways to pierce a prenup? So, I don't, here are ways. I know what's common, but duress is a biggie. So what happens is, the person with, who wants the prenup, will wait till the eve of the wedding. Nice, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, these people, like, who thinks of these things? Anyway. They wait till like, the last minute. They show this prenup and they say, I want you to sign it, otherwise, you know, my family, you know, they use the family excuse. My dad is making me do this. And by the way, I have a lawyer. Don't worry, I'll pay the lawyer. You know, everybody's on board and they sign. So that's, that's duress, right? That's like putting pressure on somebody on the eve of marriage. And we could probably get that set aside. The other thing is um, unconscionability. Some prenups are just so one-sided, it's like, you know, you just can't, you know, the court can't, like, enforce it with a straight face, you know. Particularly the spousal support. That's, like, the, the issues relating to the distribution of assets, it's called equitable distribution, what you acquire during the marriage or what you had prior to the marriage, it's more likely to leave that alone, but the spousal support, alimony, those, the, 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 the um, lifestyle type payments, that is easier to kind of get some, get some uh, traction in court. Pretty much good for second marriage. Or, or if you're married later. If you're young, love. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, that makes more sense actually, because you're dealing with the financial circumstances at that time, at the time you're getting divorced. So that makes more sense. Yes. She was too young to really opine on what she wanted. If she was older, that would have been an issue. She would have had a voice, which of course makes her being put in the middle, right? But, which has its own problems, but she was just too young. Usually, children have a voice when they start to be six or seven. There's an attorney appointed for, appointed for them. And the, the thing about the children is teenagers. Teenagers are the most important people in court. Why? Because nobody can control them. So whatever they say, they get. Because the judges know they're never going to listen to the judge. So teenagers have outsized influence in the courts. Um, let me just say one thing because we're running out of time. So I am an optimist, and I've been married for almost 15 years, and I, I, I am a big fan of marriage. And so, so let me just conclude by saying, so what does it take to be in a good marriage and for an easy divorce? Kindness, just be kind. Even when you're angry, even when you're mad, even when you hate your spouse, be kind. Those are the qualities that will make for an easy divorce and actually they make for a good marriage. Thank you very much. <laughs>